astronaut Malcolm Scott Carpenter plays the starring role in America's newest space spectacular. The 37-year-old Carpenter was the backup or stand-in pilot for John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth. Today, the Navy lieutenant commander who grew up at the corner of Aurora and 7th Streets in Boulder, Colorado, is ready for the hour when he will make the momentous journey out of this world. Colonel Glenn is among those at his side in the pre-launch period before his great adventure. Carpenter is described as self-confident, very optimistic. His fellow astronauts and the hard-working Project Mercury team equally confident of the man and his mission. The U.S. is ready to launch its second orbital flight as part of the continuing investigation leading to a manned flight to the moon and return. Before dawn at Cape Canaveral, Carpenter strides from Hangar S into the glare of lights and enters the van for the four-mile trip to the launching pad. At the launch site, it is quiet, and there is the calm which belies the tenseness which always dominates this setting, where man initiates his greatest rendezvous with space. The silver-suited Carpenter walks in the footsteps of three other astronauts, two who took short-range rides to the threshold of space, and one who blazed the orbital trail. The elevator takes Carpenter to the 11th deck where his spacecraft, Aurora 7, awaits him. Like Colonel Glenn, the Navy test pilot will attempt three orbits of the Earth. and fog interrupt an otherwise perfect countdown, and those who will bring the great story to the world in words and pictures stand by along with the army of observers and technicians. The nation and the world are glued to the happenings at the Cape. Even though it's been done before, the interest will build, the complacency will vanish once the word is flashed that Carpenter is leaving this earth. Aurora 7 and Sun as Carpenter begins his space journey on the wings of the 360,000 pound thrust Atlas missile. The 500 inch BU scope makes possible the close up of the flight of the rocket and then the moment of separation of the great booster engines. Carpenter reports significant new data back to Earth while on a path which takes him through three sunsets and three sunrises. My status is good. Uh, Roger, uh, pitch minus, minus two and a half, and you're right on, you're good. Roger, reading you loud and clear, Gus. There's little to match the drama which develops just when it appears Carpenter's three-orbit flight will end routinely. A high angle of the capsule at the time of the firing of the retro, or braking rockets, causes Carpenter to overshoot his intended landing area by 250 miles. Then, as the searing heat of re-entry builds up around his craft, all communication is lost. For long minutes, Mercury Control is unable to say whether Carpenter has survived the re-entry. The nation waits in tense, prayerful silence for an agonizing 35 minutes. Has Aurora 7's parachutes deployed to lower it to a safe landing in the sea? If they haven't, the capsule will plunge into the ocean and sink. But happily, after almost an hour of frightening uncertainty, the astronaut is located. Air Force rescue men parachute to the water. The long periods of survival training for just this kind of emergency now pay off in a precision operation. Carpenter, reported safe in a rubber life raft, will soon be taken out by helicopter along with the parachutists. The threat of calamity is lifted. People breathe again. In the words of President Kennedy, the skill and initiative of those who participated in the rescue of Commander Carpenter, coupled with Commander Carpenter's courage, is heartwarming to us all. <laughs> <laughs>